he experienced as much as 600 nanograms per deciliter increase from where he was before, which is very dramatic. It was a near tripling of where his uh, testosterone had started off to where he ended up. Many supplements are compounds that are extremely efficacious, for instance, for enhancing sleep or for enhancing hormone function or for enhancing focus. And many of those compounds are simply not found in food or are not found in enough abundance in food to have the desired effect. I'd like to take a step back and focus on the larger theme of today's episode, which is how to think about supplementation in a rational, cost-effective, and biologically effective way for each of these categories. And the three categories that I'm going to cover are sleep, hormone support, and cognitive enhancement and focus. Cognitive enhancement and focus being the final third category. Let's talk about sleep and the rational approach to thinking about supplementation for sleep. First of all, you should ask yourself how well, that is how deeply and how much are you sleeping per night? Assuming you're somebody who can fall asleep easily, stay asleep through the night, wake up feeling relatively rested, maybe a little groggy, and then can move about your day with plenty of energy and focus. You're not falling asleep in class or at work or behind the wheel or as a passenger on public transportation well, then you're probably getting enough sleep. There are people, of course, who are struggling with sleep, either falling asleep, staying asleep, or they're not feeling alert enough during the day or all of the above. And then it makes sense to step back and take a look at what supplementation can provide. There are two questions you should ask yourself. First of all, are you ingesting caffeine after 2 p.m.? If the answer is yes, you want to limit or eliminate caffeine after 2 p.m., maybe even push it back to noon or earlier. Second thing is most people would do well to avoid food within the two hours prior to bedtime. But of course, you don't wanna be so hungry that you can't fall asleep. If you are not ingesting caffeine 2 p.m. or onwards, and you are not eating excessively immediately prior to bedtime or within the two hours prior to bedtime, and you're not hungry when you go to sleep, well, then there are certain supplements that can support your sleep. For instance, you're somebody who falls asleep just fine, but wakes up in the middle of the night around two or 3 a.m. or any time for that matter and has trouble falling back asleep, there are two categories of supplements that you might want to consider. The first is myo-inositol, typically taken as 900 milligrams of myo-inositol. Myo-inositol can help shorten the amount of time that it takes to fall back asleep if you wake up in the middle of the night. Other people who wake up in the middle of the night will wake up because their dreams are very intense or they were having dreams that were so vivid that suddenly they were jolted from their dreams. Those people would do well to avoid certain supplements. Theanine can be great for many people, but for people who have excessively vivid dreams, those excessively vivid dreams can lead to immediate waking and sometimes a little bit of anxiety upon waking in the middle of the night. So some people who wake up in the middle of the night so sort of jolted mentally and physically out of sleep because of their intense dreams would do well to avoid theanine supplementation. Now, for those of you that are not waking up in the middle of the night or not having excessively vivid dreams, but are having trouble falling asleep, two supplements in particular have been shown to be effective for shortening the transition time to sleep and allowing people to ease into sleep more readily. And those are magnesium threonate, which is interchangeable with magnesium bisglycinate. People who take those often find that their transition time into sleep is much faster and their sleep is also much deeper. Incidentally, those supplements are also thought to be useful for cognitive support and neuroprotection, although there's less data on that. And then the other supplement is apigenin, A-P-I-G-E-N-I-N. -I -I apigenin, which is a derivative of chamomile, also acts as a bit of a anxiety lowering compound, which is essential prior to sleep for people to essentially turn off their thinking or to be able to reduce the amount of ruminating and problem solving and future anticipation that they're doing, which is a requirement for falling asleep. So what's the rational approach to supplementing in a way that allows you to fall asleep more quickly and stay asleep? Would you immediately take magnesium threonate and apigenin together? Well, that depends. If you have the budget and you just simply wanna fall asleep quicker and you don't care which of those two ingredients is going to be more effective for you, well, then you could try one, for instance, magnesium threonate and try it for perhaps a week and see how that affects your latency to sleep time. That is how quickly you fall asleep. Or you could try apigenin in the first week, or you could co combine them both, or you could try magnesium threonate for a week, then switch to only apigenin for a week and evaluate which one works better for you. If neither works for you, I do recommend trying the combination together. Next category of supplementation that I'd like to talk about is hormone support. 
improving or so-called optimizing your hormones is a critical aspect of mental health, physical health, and performance. The supplements that make sense in terms of augmenting hormones come in two forms. One are broadband support for multiple hormones, and then the others are supplements that are designed to increase, or in some cases decrease, specific hormones or hormone pathways. So let's consider each of those in tandem. Certain supplements, things like Shila G, for instance, something from Ayurvedic medicine, which may, mainly uh, has the active ingredient fulvic acid, which is known to, for instance, increase things like FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which in women is going to increase certain aspects of egg growth pro-fertile, and in males can make uh, for more sperm production or more motile sperm. FSH is also going to indirectly increase testosterone in males. It's known to increase libido in both males and females. So things like Shilaji can indeed augment multiple hormones and support multiple hormone systems generally in the direction of pro-fertility, pro-libido, and increasing estrogen and testosterone. There are other supplements such as ashwagandha that also fall into this category of affecting multiple hormones. Ashwagandha is a very potent supplement in terms of reducing cortisol levels. It has also been shown to increase testosterone levels, but probably indirectly. When cortisol is lowered in general, testosterone tends to increase. There are many other compounds present and available supplements that are purported to be pro-hormone support, in particular for testosterone, or estrogen, fertility, and libido. For instance, of things like maca root. Maca root can increase libido. It's found to be particularly effective in women, but in men as well, and in all people who are suffering from lowered libido due to intake of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, for whatever reason. Okay, now with all that said, I'd like to provide some examples of supplements that work more directly on specific hormone pathways aimed at achieving more specific goals, such as elevated testosterone or elevated free testosterone or elevated growth hormone. I'd like to talk about growth hormone first because it's actually a pretty short discussion. First of all, the best way to augment growth hormone is to get quality deep sleep, especially the sleep that occurs in the first three or four hours of the night is when growth hormone is released. And it's going to be beneficial to avoid caloric intake in the two hours preceding sleep. Many people use intermittent fasting or even longer periods of fasting to increase growth hormone. Indeed, while lengthier fasts or intermittent fasting can increase growth hormone levels very substantially. It has indirect effects on the genetic pathways and the receptors for growth hormone that actually are detrimental for the function of growth hormone. So avoiding food for the two hours prior to bedtime is a good idea. If you avoid food for longer, that's just going to assist even more. But extended fasts specifically for the purpose of increasing growth hormone are not really logical when you look at the broader effects of extended fast. Now, in terms of supplements to increase growth hormone, there are very few supplements that have been shown to augment this pathway. There is some idea that arginine supplementation prior to bedtime can further elevate levels of growth hormone, especially when fasted. That literature is rather weak. Not a lot of supplements out there to increase growth hormone potently. Now, it's a different story when you start thinking about and talking about testosterone and free testosterone and luteinizing hormone. There is a hormone called GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone that is released from the hypothalamus into the pituitary. It stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone or LH, which then travels in the bloodstream to impact multiple tissues in the body, but mainly the ovary in females and the testes in males to stimulate estrogen production and testosterone production. Supplements that can tickle this pathway or actually can act as a bit more of a directed hammer on this luteinizing hormone pathway may also impact GnRH are things like Fidogia agrestis. This is an herb that when taken at dosages of 600 milligrams per day, many people, not all, report elevated levels of libido, elevated sperm production, elevated testosterone, in some cases, elevated estrogen, a bunch of hormones downstream of luteinizing hormone. But I do want to suggest caution when taking Fidogia agrestis. The cautionary notes are stay within the recommended dosage ranges. You can go lower, but certainly don't go higher. And I think it is wise to cycle every eight weeks or so to come off it for two weeks and then going back on if that's your choice, if you feel it benefited you. 
or taking it for 12 week periods of time and then cycling off for a full month before repeating again. There are other supplements, in particular Tongat Ali, which is known to, for instance, increase libido, whether or not it does that by way of augmenting dopamine related pathways or testosterone pathways still isn't clear. It is known to increase free testosterone by reducing sex hormone binding globulin. Tonga Ali can be beneficial both for men and for women. In dosages anywhere from 200 milligrams to 600 milligrams per day. One individual I know who took Tonga Ali, uh, admittedly on my recommendation, his testosterone was initially very low and he was having a number of different symptoms. He did blood work and he then took Tonga Ali and Fidoja in combination and he experienced big increases in testosterone. This would be uh, not free, but total testosterone. He experienced as much as 600 nanograms per deciliter increase from where he was before, which is very dramatic. It was a near tripling of where his uh, testosterone had started off to where he ended up. To my knowledge, Tonga Ali does not need to be cycled, meaning you don't have to take periods of time off from it. I should note that the effects of Tonga Ali can take a little bit longer to experience. The next category of supplementation that I'd like to address is supplements related to cognitive enhancement and focus. And here there are a number of very useful strategies that one could take. I'd like to divide this conversation into two general categories of supplements to address cognitive enhancement and focus. The first category are supplements that increase energy by way of stimulant properties. So the most obvious of these is caffeine. Caffeine is of course, a molecule that can increase levels of alertness. It also can increase levels of focus provided that dosages are in the appropriate range. The appropriate range in most cases is going to be one to three milligrams per kilogram of body weight taken 30 minutes or so before any kind of mental or physical endeavor. Again, a cautionary note, don't drink caffeine too late in the day. Past 2 p.m., it can really start to impede uh, your sleep at night. Even if you can fall asleep at night, the architecture of that sleep is not going to be great if you're ingesting caffeine in the preceding eight to 10 and even 12 hours. I mention all that not because I think that you probably already didn't know that caffeine can enhance alertness and focus. Most people already know that and I acknowledge that, but rather as a contrast point for the other supplement-based approach for increasing cognitive function and focus, which is to increase certain neurotransmitter pathways that are not stimulant based. So for instance, alpha GPC, which is essentially a choline donor, acts in the pathways related to the neuromodulator acetylcholine and can enhance focus. Dosages of anywhere from 300 to 600 milligrams, people experience heightened levels of focus for sake of mental work or physical work. The half-life of alpha GPC is about four to six hours. So it's relatively short lasting, although you wouldn't necessarily want to take it right before bed. I don't recommend that. So for instance, 300 milligrams to 600 milligrams of alpha GPC taken alone will allow people to be more focused, but doesn't tend to make people feel jittery or overstimulated. Similarly, 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams of something like L-tyrosine, which is amino acid precursor to dopamine. What people tend to experience is that the cholinergic stimulation from alpha GPC and the dopaminergic stimulation from L-tyrosine leads to increased levels of focus without the kind of overall feelings of stimulant-based alertness that one would experience with caffeine. I do think that there's a category of supplements that can greatly enhance the probability of offsetting depression and maybe even improve mood directly or indirectly and or offset the amount of antidepressant medication that people need to take. That's also been demonstrated and improve metabolic function cardiovascular function, and also enhance our ability to do focused work. And here I'm referring to the so-called omega-3 essential fatty acids, in particular, the omega-3 form of the essential fatty acids. Ingesting one to three grams of EPA in particular in the form of either fish oil capsules or liquid can be beneficial for a number of different aspects of brain and body health and can enhance focus and cognitive ability. 